Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. It's Charlie Foxtrot, Foxtrot, Papa Bravo, Lake Buccaneer, 7,500 feet. Whew. Paul Briggs and I just crashed a Lake Buccaneer on a lake in Northern Ontario. And now we'll see what happens next. <laughs> Welcome to Tom Air. My name's Tom Comet. I'm a multi-engine, IFR-rated pilot. I fly a Cessna 337 Skymaster, and this channel's all about my adventures in aviation. We decided to start things off right with a quick, well, not so quick, flight across Canada and back again in a Lake LA-4 200 Buccaneer aircraft with my good buddy, Paul Briggs. Paul and I go way back, well, in my world, we go way back in aviation, back to when I bought my Skymaster six years ago. Paul was the broker on the Skymaster deal. We've since flown, I'll bet you 200 hours together, side Probably. by side, in various different aircraft. We've had lots of adventures. We actually flew to the Northwest Territories last summer, well, two summers ago now, it seems like last summer, mm -hmm. in a uh, 1947 Norden Norseman aircraft. And this trip we're gonna talk about today Paul and I had to deliver not one, but two Lake Buccaneer aircrafts across Canada. One was going to Calgary, Alberta, and then we were bringing another one from Calgary, Alberta, back to Muskoka, Ontario. And it was quite an adventure, as you will soon find out. These airplanes are the classic old flying boat design. It's a water hull, retractable gear, uh, sponsons for when it's in the water, gear for when it's on land, um, not super fast, 105 knots over the ground. Um, what else can you tell me about the Lake Buccaneer aircraft, Paul? Well, the Lake Buccaneer is uh, it's an old design. Uh, it actually started uh, prior to the lake manufacturing um, in the 1950s. And uh, when it became a lake in 1960, um, it was a little bigger, a little more powerful, and uh, originally started with a 180 horse carbureted engine and then became a 200 horse uh, fuel injected engine. Um, just a lovely airplane to fly, very, uh, very utilitarian, um, and just great on the water and uh, uh, very rugged as trailing link gear. Uh, Lake Central, for whom I'm the uh, director of aircraft sales, we've handled these airplanes continuously since 1964. So we, we're, we can build them, we can we have, hold parts manufacturing authority on them, uh, we do maintenance on them, modifications, you name it, we do it. They have a very distinctive sound to them. Um, as you probably remember, um, the, uh, the lake airplanes are not going to set any speed records uh, because you are in fact flying a boat with yeah. wings. <laughs> yeah, we found that out. And uh, yeah, so uh, fortunately uh, we were delivering the one particular airplane to Calgary Springbank and bringing the owner's other airplane back to Muskoka. It was just about ready for annual inspection and um, uh, then I was going to sell the airplane for them. But um, there's more to that story. Yeah, it's uh, so the lake is basically, it's an airplane that People that love them, love them a lot. Yes. It's sort of like the Skymaster. I can totally relate to the lake. It's an unusual design. It's sort of the odd duck. Most people are used to standard straight float, standard yes. float. That's what a float plane is to yes. most people. A flying boat is something that's unique, something that's different. People that love them, absolutely love them. Other people look at them and they don't even understand what they're looking at. The thing that I love about the lakes is they will outperform the Cessnas on way less horsepower and way less fuel. And today, at the price of fuel, uh, on our journey out and back, uh, you might be interested to know, the most we paid for fuel was $3.62 a litre. Yeah. A litre. Yeah. So that's pretty expensive. The thing, the thing that really impressed me when you first started showing me the lakes was when we went up to Muskoka and we were doing that video shoot and you put the gear down in the water and then you 
pulled up on that little tiny, it wasn't even a, I wouldn't call it a beach, I'd call it just no, a little. No, it wasn't a beach. It was, it was a little bay next to this guy's house and you clawed that thing out of the water and then turned it around on yep. that tiny little patch of land and it was, this was unpaved, unprepared, it was a uh, bush. It was a bush, it was a, a beach next to some bush yep. and you managed to get that aircraft out of the water and turned around in, in nowhere. And I mean, you can't do that with floats, obviously. No, no, even an amphib float uh, plane, you can't. And the reason for that, the, with amphib floats, the nose dolly wheel is quite small. It's, it's, it's not larger than that, yeah, usually. It'll never spin on a beach. It, it just would dig in. Yeah. Um, and not only that, the torsional stress uh, on it, especially in gravel or stones or whatever, you're going to do harm to it. Whereas with the, the lake airplanes, they have a big nose wheel. Uh, it, it runs 27 PSI. Um, so it'll go over most of those stones and stuff. So yeah, the lake is basically, it's a flying boat. Generally speaking, you would fly these things in the summer months or the, the warmer seasons. Yep. That's when they would be used. They'd be landed on open water or on paved runways or grass runways. Yep. Um, we chose to, this one needed to be delivered in the middle of winter yep. in Canada. So there was some challenges involved in that. Yes. You know, it was, it was the weather's not great. Um, we got a nice little weather window that we took advantage of. Um, keeping the plane warm was a big issue. Staying warm in the plane was a, a big issue yeah, as well. Absolutely, yep. Um, we traveled with uh, heaters. We traveled with extension cords so we could plug in everywhere we go. Luckily, you know, everybody at every airport across Canada somehow. <laughs> so we were able to oftentimes get hangar space, yes. talk people into letting us in and, and spending the night and yeah. et cetera, because otherwise we would have just froze up, like the plane wouldn't have, wouldn't well, have functioned the, properly. The reality is that, you know, we, we had to prepare for the worst. So we're all ready to load up into this 1981 LA4200 flying boat. Yep. And we're going to fly Lake it Buccaneer. to uh, Lake Buccaneer. We're going to fly to Calgary Springbank. Yep. Deliver it to its sighted new owner. Yes, indeed. And it's going to be a very pleasurable trip. We hope. Uneventful. Uneventful. It's going to be an the uneventful. Key. The key. Uneventful voyage. <laughs> Let's hope for that. Yep. All that right. Sounds like fun. Well, I'm looking up. forward to it. Let's load and go. So yeah, the trip out. Everything went according, pretty well according to plan. It was great. It was a big storm the night we left. So that was exciting, but we got out, we got out after that. Um, pretty heavy, heavy winds that first day, real gusty, heavy winds. I remember the, the land, our first landing in, so we started in Muskoka. The first landing was uh, Gore Bay, Manitoulin. Yep. And there was only the one runway open and there was a 90 or a 90 degree, 31 knot crosswind and I was, I mean, that was, I think, my first landing in a lake, not on, well, probably my second landing in a lake, not on yes. water. Yeah, um, that's right. And I was pretty <laughs> impressed at your crosswind, uh, <laughs> the crosswind capabilities of you and the aircraft on a slippery runway. It was, it was, a, it was a nasty day. There was a jet stream that was, uh, that was driving uh, the weather and uh, the winds were ferocious. Uh, we had faced tough headwinds uh, on that leg from Muskoka over to uh, Gorbe Manitoulin. And uh, like you said, 90 degrees at 31 knots. Uh, but it calls for a knowledge of pilot techniques and judicious application. Um, it also helps to have an airplane that's as robust mm -hmm. as the Lake Buccaneer, which has trailing link landing gear. So you can dish out a tremendous amount of punishment uh, on the landing, but as you saw, it was not a problem for that airplane. No, no, it was amazing. We headed on towards the Sault Ste. Marie yep. that night, decided not to go any further because of the, again, because of the weather. Um, and it was gonna get dark. Yeah, there was, a couple, there was a couple times during the trip when things came up, certainly things that me being less ex a less experienced pilot just I just don't think of and then I get in I mean that's why I do these trips with you because every time I do them I learn so much yeah um, so uh, one of those was being I remember I think it was when we were leaving Gorbe I was doing the big big turnout as you do after after takeoff going to get on on course and I just go to touch the GPS and press 
direct to because that's what I do. I'm, I'm cutting corners. I'm like, well, we're going to Sault Ste. Marie. Let's, we've just taken off. There's no point in going back to the track. I'm just going to press direct to and draw a straight line and make things a little quicker. And you slap my hand away. Felt like we were in flight training again with your wooden spoon. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and why did I do that? And you though? said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going direct to, I'm trying to save us some, some time and some fuel. And you said, no, don't do that. Because we were, you were right from the start, very, uh, you, you made sure we were, we uh, called flight service yep. and we were on a flight plan for every leg of the journey. And we were absolutely religious about keeping those flight plans up to date. Yes. And then also once we got in the air, letting them know, okay, we took off. 15 minutes after we said we were going to or whatever, so they knew exactly where we were on our track. And then you said, you followed that up, because when I was pressing direct to you, you said, don't do that, because they're going to be, if, God forbid, something happens, they're looking on that track. Famous last words. Famous last words. <laughs> they're looking between, you know, Gorbe, Manitoulin, and they're going to draw a straight line to Sault Ste. Marie. Exactly. They're going to look on either side of that pink line. Yeah. They, they aren't going to know how many times you press direct to because you you just decided to yeah they're going to take that straight line and they're going to they're going to set out a grid on each side of that i mean you you might be well south or north or east or west easily of your of your track they might take an extra long time to find you or they might not find you correct so that was good learning as you'll soon see um and then one of the other, well, there was, there was lots of these little things, but you were adamant about us not, like, I was like, why aren't we just continuing on to Thunder Bay? Because Thunder, like, the, I was like, let's, let's get there. That let's was get there, our let's objective. Get back. And our objective yeah. for the day, well, our objective for the day in make-believe world had been Winnipeg. <laughs> yes. but we both knew from the second we left. We we'd take get, Thunder Bay, though. Yeah, we'd take Thunder Bay. But Thunder Bay, we would have got to after dark and we were forced to the southern route because the nor north of Lake Superior was, the low. weather was very low. Yeah. Wind was primarily out of the southwest. It was very strong because of the jet stream. And the, the only viable safe route for us was to take the northern route, southern uh, route. over uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. Right. And then, and then cut uh, across Ile Royale into Thunder Bay which would have put us on that crossover from Il Royale to Thunder Bay after dark. Yeah. And you weren't willing to no take, way. you were, you were like, <laughs> no, no we're not taking that risk. We're not doing it. And then me in my mind, I'm like, we have a flying boat. Like, what does it matter? The water's open. <laughs> yeah. If we, if, and duh. Yeah, it's a flying boat, but you land in the middle of Lake Superior in the winter. At night. At night, you're in, you're dead. 15 foot swells, yeah. you know, basically you're going to founder in uh, after about the third swell and uh, then you're going to die of hypothermia in under five minutes. Yeah, which, I mean, you saying it that way makes total sense. Me thinking it, because I, you know, I, I own a twin now too. I'm pretty blasé about, yes. like when I'm flying to Sault Ste. Marie, I go down the middle of the lake, whatever's the straightest line is what I take. Yes. So yes. now all of a sudden we're back in this, you know, a single, single engine, engine thinking. This thinking. So. Yeah. That's and true. rightfully so. So it took us two days to get to Winnipeg instead of the instead plan, of one. <laughs> plan one day, but that was fine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We still haven't been weathered out at all, which is great. Nope. And that nope. we didn't that get weathered out the whole trip. So Winnipeg was great. Um, the next day, flying west from Winnipeg was the. I think that was pretty well the worst headwinds we saw. Probably the most depressing flight uh, in a very long time because we could consistently see a ground speed of 47 knots. Yeah, I remember seeing 47 knots and thinking, it's, when my, it's almost like when my instructor took me out in the 172 when I first started and had us flying backwards yes. one day because yeah. the, wind, the headwind was so strong. Yeah, and it, it's, I mean, we were running 24 inches and 2400 RPM, um, you know, 75% power, uh, but it was just the prairie winds were so intense and uh, they were not backing down. And we, we basically carried that all the way, all the way. almost Almost to all the way. It got better that e evening. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah we, were we were following the Trans-Canada most of that portion of the trip. And you could see vehicles on the Trans-Canada just yeah. heading off into the distance. And yeah. we were moving slower than they were. And we got gas and swift current, um, self-serve. And 
that trip, we did the next leg into, uh, into Calgary Springbank. We elected to do that single engine at night. Um, but over flat, flat land, prairies. Over the prairies. Snowy. Yeah. Yeah. Completely different thing. That was the only night, real night flying we'd done. Yes. On the trip. That's right. Yeah. And at that point, we were trying to, we, had, we didn't have get there-itis, but we did want to get there because well, we also had to get back. We also had to get back and, yeah. and we didn't want to waste time. Um, and it's also a cost for the, the customer. So we, you know, it behooves the ferry pilot to move efficiently. Uh, so we got in late, mm -hmm. uh, but put the airplane in the hangar and all was good. We had a, we had a good night's sleep and the, the uh, new owner of the airplane was very happy with his, with his purchase. Yep. Yeah, so we had a quick, quick little turnaround in Calgary and then you decided, because again the weather was still open, it was still good, yes. looking good, yep. and the window ahead of us looked reasonably good. Yep. So you were, I was hoping we'd have a day in Calgary to, you know, stretch yeah. our legs a little bit, maybe do some yoga. You went for a walk. I went for a walk and that was like the only, and then you were like, let's go, let's go. Well, the, the, as a long term ferry pilot, the, my rule of thumb has always been, if the weather's good, we fly. Yeah. And uh, even if it's not good, we, we try to fly. Try to fly. What yeah. you, what's your saying? We'll, we'll stick our nose in it. We'll stick our nose in. Stick yeah. our nose in. See what's what see it's what's like. See what's going on. <laughs> so we changed changed aircraft. The, there was a few little bits and pieces to be tidied up on the the second one. Yeah, yeah. Pretty well an identical plane, smaller yep. engine, a few less two less, blade prop, two blade prop autopilot that was maybe a little less functional than the first one. Yes, or that was very nice actually. In the, the first, first one, one was that autopilot. Yeah. We used it probably half the time. Oh yeah, at least yeah, yeah, it was good. Or there was the ta Tomo pilot. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we headed out early afternoon in the second one, heading basically retracing our our steps. Yep. Back. Yep. For our Down to back. Swift Current for yep. gas, and and uh, it was quite amazing to actually see like uh, 115 knots on on the GPS. Yeah, it felt like we were. Flying, like we finally. were flying. We were finally flying <laughs> yeah. and not not driving a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, it was a good a good trip back, and then of course uh, we refueled in uh, in Swift Current and carried on to uh, Regina. Regina. We saw the Cirrus jet. We saw the Cirrus I saw jet. My, I saw my first Cirrus jet. I'd only seen it in photos before, so that was. And we also impressive. saw a uh, Canada Air CL 215T, 215T, which right. is a turbine version of the uh, of the venerable uh, CL 215 water bomber. So a gigantic flying boat, and we have I have that picture of, of the lake park next to the exactly. CL 215. You'll have to put that on the. Yeah, it's a good shot. Actually. Yeah, I was amazed. It, it's am I find it amazing in aviation. Like obviously you have your little Rolodex, or it's on your phone now, but you you've got all these contacts all the way across Canada and the fact that you know we're just we just showed up at what was it 6 p.m. Jordan came in drove in opened the hangar for us pushed a three million dollar aircraft out yes. on, just on the ramp tied yeah. it up and so we could have a warm place to park yeah. our aircraft for the yeah. night like that's that's aviation and tool you guys need tools do you, and then the FBO gave us the car for the night to go that's into right. town like yeah. Morgan Aviation absolutely and like it's just so authentic yeah that way yeah you know? it's 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 the last bastion of of uh, you know common decency and and uh, good things in in society we yeah. we're very fortunate in aviation I love that about it like that old fashioned politeness yeah. of it like yeah. even the even when you're on the radio the you know good day sir and yeah ha, you know the that old that Keeps community that old fashioned Keeps you know, it real. sense of realness yeah so anyway the the big day our final day our really big flying, day our big, <laughs> our big day out um started the day in dryden things yep. were great um minus 18 on the ground by cold. the time we were ready to fire up the engine Yep. It fired up and the heater came on right away. Boom, off we, off we went. Uh, first stop was Marathon. Marathon. Yeah. Landed in Marathon. Three hours away. Yeah. And by then we were starting to feel pretty 
confident that we might get all the way home on yeah, that. Well, because the weather was getting better too. The weather was there was, but there was a storm coming in. So in kind of wanted Southern to get in Ontario. Ahead. That's right. Yeah, there was. Marathon. We refueled. Did a quick turnaround there. Uh, headed off, uh, and you suggested then that we over instead of again doing a straight line from there to uh, Sudbury. Sudbury. Yep. You were like, let's overfly Shaplo, let's, and then let's do Shaplo to yep. Sudbury again. So there's, there's always an out, always, always, an out. always plan to have a place that you can, you can go. Like you may notice something. Oh, my oil pressure is fluctuating a bit. Uh, I'd like the opportunity to at least have a look at this on the ground and be sure that there's, I'm not losing oil or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, just to have that option in your pocket, you don't have to land, yeah. but if something comes up, then keep it in your pocket and use it. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was, a, that was a, another big learning for sure. We'd left Marathon. We're heading to Sudbury at that point, and then we decided to, let's, the, we think we can get in before the weather arrives in Muskoka. Yep. Let's go direct Muskoka. We updated flight services to let them know what we were doing. But let's not forget that we we had the tom special charcuterie board oh right we'd had lunch we had lunch we had our epic last meal yes. in the plane yes uh caught up on top of your ipad we had a nice selection of salami and uh prepared meat and cheese and it was uh it would have cost you a hundred bucks any place yeah. you wanted to eat um and then we just had that all nicely put away yeah and everything was good and I think, I seem to remember I was flying. Yep. I was flying, and then we just, there was a little something. Yep. It wasn't even anything. It was just like a, a something. Something happened, and, we, and you could feel it in your left ass cheek or, yep. or something. Yep. And we both looked at one looked another at each other. and said, did you feel that? And then and we both said, yeah. And then you grabbed, you took control. Yep, I have control. Rightfully so. And you started playing around with, you know, mixture, fuel pump, you know, the standard prop pitch just started adjusting stuff and then all hell broke loose it looks like we're losing the engine no. yep okay so uh we're 50 we're 50 miles to looks like 55 miles to Sudbury that way 40 miles to Elliott Lake it it started to vibrate it had a very unhappy vibration and I I said to you, Tom I think we're going to lose this engine and it just, there was no way. And at that point, you were looking at your iPad and you were saying it's 55 miles to Sudbury. Sudbury 40 it's to 40, Elliott Lake. Yeah, 40 to Elliott Lake. And I'm thinking, we're not going to either one of those places tonight. Yeah. And so from 7,500 feet, the engine very quickly came to an abrupt stop. It got very quiet. Very quiet, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, I can't keep this thing running. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Mayday, mayday, mayday. It's Charlie Foxtrot, Foxtrot, Papa Bravo, Lake Buccaneer, 7,500 feet, 55 miles northwest of Sudbury. We have an engine failure and we will attempt to land on the ice. Two souls on board. It's Charlie Foxtrot, Foxtrot, Papa Bravo. You can just hear wind noises. Yeah. But I mean, I'm very thankful for the fact that I'm a glider pilot. That's how I started, was it as, as an air cadet glider pilot. Right. Yeah, I love gliding. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm not afraid of that. And uh, so we, we looked visually to see what our options were uh, in terms of a lake to set down on. It was a scattered layer. It was a scattered was layer. Nice, but there was quite a few good sized holes yep. in it so you yeah. could see the ground and you could see the you could see lakes and you could see yeah. trees and yeah there was a lot but it was also five o'clock at night yeah uh so you know we didn't have a lot of ambient light um but um you know you had picked a lake that i felt was a bit of a stretch mm -hmm. uh we'd have we probably could have made the lake but we wouldn't have had any maneuvering options right um, I preferred to take a lake that was sort of shaped like a golf club. Uh, it had a long arm, north-south arm, and then it had a, a rounded portion at the bottom, uh, which, you know, it was actually quite a big lake. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, so then we were fairly close to the lake and I decided to, that was where we were going to touch down. And uh, so uh, one of the things that you did uh, was you reached over and turned the 406 ELT. Okay, Paul, I'm going to turn on the 406 ELT. So okay, cool. looks good. We still got lots of height. Uh, we're on glide speed. Uh, I think this is remote country in here. Uh, okay, let's uh, prepare for landing. Uh, we're on glide speed. I'm essentially on a wide right base uh, here, I'm wide and high. Okay, uh, which leg are we aiming for, Paul? Is it okay. that one? No, no, I want the one further to the west. It's longer and it gives us more options. It's lower country to get into the, into the lake. We were talking to Sudbury, we were talking to London Radio, um, and you got you got two Mayday calls out, yep. and they replied to at least one of them. Uh, one of them, They, yeah, re they replied to, and they knew, our, they knew who we were. We were on a our, flight plan. We were on a flight plan, uh, and then I got the ELT out, and then we also both wear the spot, tra the spot transmitters, yep. Yep. satellite transmitters, um, and I actually turned my, my SOS. I pushed the red button, which I'd never pushed before. Yeah, I've never used it before either. Yeah, so I pushed the red button on the spot while we were still in the air, because again, I mean, I'd learned to do this stuff in the air. Yes. Because you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you might hit this lake and you, you might end up underwater. I mean, you, you never that know. Stuff might never all be know. gone. Yeah. So it's use get it, it while you got it. Exactly. So we got all that done, and then you brought us in for an awesome landing. Well, it, forced landing, but it I'm, was a forced landing. But I mean, um, I, I burned off some altitude and lined myself up. Uh, you know, with the long part of the lake. And, uh, you know, the, I think the coolest thing is that you had the, the timing and the thought to turn the cameras on in the airplane. Mm. So we do have video of this, which your uh, viewers will see. Um, and um, you can see in the video where you say, oh, there's open water on the lake. And I actually look over, yeah, there's open water over there. Uh, but saw a road. Yeah. Did see a, a road that maybe was in use, maybe not. It was hard to tell. Yeah, it was an old, old bush road. Yeah. Um, and um, then we just touched down. There's no fires. There's no fire. Nicely done, sir. I'm going to uh, shut the electrical system off. Okay. And you, you can see the airplane sort of hopping. Uh, and the reason it was doing that was we were breaking through uh, about three inches of ice over top of three inches of water. And then there was good clear blue ice below that. Mm -hmm. um, and we came to rest and uh, we we basically said, okay, while the cabin is still warm, let's think about we what we're going to do. Gas. There's no, there's no smell no of fire, gas, there's no, no gas. fire. So shut everything off, and uh, we made our plan, and then we. But then we fired up again, and we called 121.5. And we called uh, yes. blind on 121.5. Yes, I did. I did a broadcast on 21.5, and basically said that we had landed safely, and GPS there were no no injuries. No injuries. That was that was important. Mayday, 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 Mayday. Charlie Fox, 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 Fox. We're down on a lake. Four seven decimal one two zero north. Eight two decimal zero five eight west. Anyone copy? Uh, and that played out later in the in the. But we didn't hear anything back. No. But as it turns out, an Air Canada flying over. Heard the because they're always monitoring 121.5. Exactly. They heard it and they relayed it on. Exactly. And that was the only way they knew we'd landed and we were safe. Yes. And so, uh, I mean, from the time we came to rest, we took some uh, we took some pictures. Um, As you do. And uh, <laughs> which, if you're with Tom, you're always going to take pictures. Whew. Paul Briggs and I just crashed a lake buccaneer on a lake in northern Ontario. And now we'll see what happens next for me. <laughs>